And now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On you, Huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Going, going, gone. That's the way Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice disappears at breakfast time. These ready-to-serve cereals hit the spot from first to last delicious spoonful. Yes, wheat or rice shot from guns is exploded up to eight times normal size to make it crisp and tender. Tomorrow morning, fill a bowl with Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Top with fruit, like, say, sliced bananas. Add milk or cream and sugar. Talk about swell tasting. Say, just you watch it disappear, but fast. <laughs> Hobo was a big dog, a cross between a St. Bernard and a Husky. He was extremely likable. He had hundreds of friends in and around Dawson, and he was welcomed wherever he went. But he never stayed in one place for long. The Northwest Mounted Headquarters was one of his regular stops, however. He had a great admiration for King and for Sergeant Preston, and he would always bring the sergeant a present. Hey, Sergeant, look at that big dog coming down the street. Sergeant. Over there where I'm pointing. Oh, yes, that's Hobo. Here comes Hobo King. Hey, who does he belong to? No one. No one? What a lead dog he'd make. That's where you're wrong, Jim. Not that he hasn't been broken to harness, he has. And he doesn't mind hard work. Well, why shouldn't he make a good lead? Because there isn't a leash or a run that can hold him. He's afflicted with wanderlust. Sometimes it hits him even when he's in harness. If a rabbit should cross his trail, he'd run into the woods after to forget all about the sled behind him. But he could be trained. Just try it. He's always terribly ashamed when he does something wrong, and he asks so hard to be forgiven that you can't possibly punish him. I could get tough with him. Perhaps. Wouldn't help, though. He'd be doing the same thing again 15 minutes later. Oh, here he comes. What's that in his mouth? A present for me. He always brings one to pay for his supper. Well, what is it? There's no telling. This time it's... Oh. <laughs> a dead fish. Yes, as ripe as they come. Thank you, Hobo. You thank him? Well, he probably considers it a very valuable gift. King, take it into the woods and bury it. King had to bury most of the presents that Hobo brought the sergeant. But Hobo continued to bring them because he was always getting into the sergeant's debt. For instance, one afternoon as King and the sergeant were walking down Front Street... They saw a prospector who was leading a pack horse, lashing out at Hobo with a long whip. Come on, King. Let's see what Hobo's up to now. What's the matter with you, crazy mutt? Get away from my horse. I'll show you. What's the matter here? Oh, that dog. I don't know what's the matter with him. Look at him trying to jump up on my horse's back. King, make him be quiet. There, he'll behave. Now, uh, let me explain about Hobo and old Red here. You just bought Red, didn't you? Well, yes, Sergeant. Day before yesterday, that is. From Cherokee Bill. That's right, Sergeant. Well, one day about a year ago, Cherokee was leading old Red down the street, and Hobo came up to say hello. Red had a pack saddle on, but he wasn't loaded, just as he is today. Hobo had a little cut on his front paw, and he was limping, so Cherokee asked him if he'd like a ride. <laughs> then he lifted the dog up on the horse's back, and he rode the whole length of Front Street. And ever since then, if Cherokee were leading Red, and if he weren't carrying supplies, Hobo would get a ride. 
That's what he wants now. A ride? Yes. <laughs> of all the highfalutin dogs, Hobo takes the cake. A ride he wants. Well, if old Red don't mind, I don't. You can have your ride, Hobo. <laughs> Look at him sitting there as if he owned the world. <laughs> I swear, Sergeant, I never saw the like before. Well, come on, Red. His Majesty wants to see the town. <laughs> The prospector started down the street, chuckling to himself. But in Hobo's mind, it was the sergeant who had saved him from a whipping and had arranged the ride. The next morning, young Constable Downey called the sergeant to the window of the barracks. Come here and take a look, sergeant. Your friend Hobo's bringing you another present. Oh, I was afraid of that. I did him a good turn yesterday. What is it this time? <laughs> Looks like a bundle of clothes. Hobo! What's the matter? That's a baby! It was true. Hobo was trotting toward the barracks, carrying the Martin's year-old daughter by the back of her dress. The little girl crowed and gurgled and was having a wonderful time until the sergeant reached her and lifted her in his arms. Then she started to cry. Thank you, Hobo. Yes, it doesn't seem to be... A little mad, perhaps. I think she was enjoying her ride. Who is she? Nancy Martin. Her mother and father live just outside of town on the river. I'll take her. Oh. Hey, here comes a woman. See the mother? Oh, yes. Hello, Mrs. Martin. Oh, is she all right, Sergeant? Here, I'll take her. There. there. She hasn't been hurt, I'm sure. Hobo was carrying her by the back of a dress. Oh, yes, I saw that. I knew he wouldn't hurt her. You're a good dog, Hobo, but you just don't have any sense. King wouldn't do a thing like that. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. I know you didn't mean any harm. What happened? Why, Nancy was playing outside the cabin, and I was baking some bread. I went inside to see how it was coming along, and when I came out, well, the little tyke had crawled all the way to the bank of the river. Hobo was watching her, and just as she reached the very edge, he picked her up by the dress and started toward town with her. I called to him, but he didn't pay the slightest bit of attention. He kept right on going. Now, why do you suppose he brought Nancy here? Well, uh, he may have thought she was lost, that we'd take her home. Land sakes. Could it be he's smart instead of dumb? <laughs> no, no, I could never believe that. But you did save her from falling in the river, Hobo. And you deserve a reward. Now, you come home with me, and I'll give you a good dinner. Come on, now. Goodbye, Sergeant. Goodbye, Mrs. Martin. <laughs> Sergeant. Yes, Constable. <laughs> you better discourage Hobo from bringing you any more presents. Hmm. I'll do my best, Constable. You can depend on that. But it was shortly after that that the cold weather set in, and Sergeant Preston left Dawson for the first of his winter patrols. The patrol lasted nearly a month. On his last night out of Dawson, he made camp on the banks of the Yukon near Gonaway Creek. At one o'clock, King sprang to his feet and growled a warning. Instantly, the sergeant was awake. What is it, boy? The fire had almost burned out. There was a light snow falling, and the sergeant was unable to see anything. Suddenly, King's tenseness relaxed. He barked and wagged his tail. A moment later, Hobo came rushing up to the sergeant and dropped a hunting cap at the sergeant's feet. Hobo! What a time to pay a visit, and another present. Now, just where'd you get this? Hobo raced around the campfire in a wide circle, barking a welcome. Wait. But the sergeant's expression changed as he examined Hobo's gift. Hey there, there's a big stain. Frozen, of course, but it's blood. Hobo, come here. Come here this minute. Take it, Hobo. Go on, take it back. Hobo thought the sergeant was inviting him to play. He picked up the cap, raced around the campfire once more, and then dropped the cap at the sergeant's feet again. Oh, fine. No cooperation from him, King. Guess I'll have to leave it up to you, boy. Here, smell. Now, fine, King. Fine. King understood. The sergeant wanted him to follow the scent on the cap. He lifted his nose to the wind that was blowing from the north. There was no help there. Nothing doing, King. No clue in the breeze. Well, that's all right, boy. Hobo's tracks won't be completely covered over yet. We can follow them. Come on. The sergeant took a small hurricane lantern from his sled, lit it, and started south, the direction from which Hobo had come. He found the big dog's tracks and pointed them out to King. There, boy. That's the trail. Follow it. Oh, wait just a second, King. Let's have another look at you, Hobo. You're wearing a harness, aren't you? And here's the end of a trace still snapped to it. 
You chewed through this, Hobo. You were harnessed to a sled, and you chewed through the traces. And where'd you pick up this cat? Go on, King. Follow the trail, boy. King started out with Hobo trotting by his side and the sergeant following close behind. In ten minutes, he was unable to see the tracks that Hobo had made. But King was following a scent and never hesitated. Half an hour later, they came to the edge of the forest. A little farther on, there was a clearing. And in the clearing, the sergeant could make out the dim shadow of a cabin. There was no light, but King growled. The sergeant put out the hurricane lantern. Go on, boy. At the side of the cabin, there was a series of half-filled hollows in the snow. A dog team had burrowed here. My guess is you chewed through your traces here, Hobo. The wind's blowing from the direction we've come. You decided to pay King and me a visit, and you brought your usual present. King was standing in front of the cabin, growling low and sniffing at the crack beneath the door. All right, boy, we'll take a look inside. As soon as the door was open, King trotted in. It was impossible for the sergeant to see anything. He stopped in the doorway to light the lantern once more. King was standing in the far corner. As the sergeant walked toward him with the lantern, he turned. He looked up into the sergeant's face and whimpered. A man was lying on the floor, face down, bareheaded. It was easy to see where the blood on the cap had come from now. The sergeant turned the man over. He placed his ear against the man's chest. Still alive, King, but he's been badly beaten. We've got to get him to a hospital and get him there fast. We'll continue our story in just a moment. I am, I am a magician. Yes, on this empty table before me, by merely waving my magic wand, I shall produce a tiger. Presto, magic, look. And now I shall instantly change this most ferocious animal of the cat family into the tamest. Presto, magic, look. And now for the greatest feat of all. On the table are two bowls, cereal bowls. You see, they're empty. Now in my right hand, I have two packages, big red and blue packages. Now in a twinkling, you shall see the most delicious breakfast treat on earth. A bowl brimful of Quaker puff wheat or Quaker puff rice. The ready to serve breakfast cereals Shot from gun. Yes, there's no beating this eaten. For breakfast, enjoy Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice topped with milk or cream and your favorite fruit. These giant king-sized kernels of premium wheat or rice shot from guns are exploded eight times larger to make them crisp and tender. They're shot through and through with nut-like flavor, too. Best of all, you don't have to be a magician to enjoy wheat or rice shot from guns morning after morning. Simply ask Mom right now to order those famous big red and blue packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. He's your guarantee that you're getting the original, the one and only Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Now to continue our story. It was eight o'clock when the sergeant reached the hospital in Dawson with a man he had found in the deserted cabin, but it was still quite dark. The sergeant waited for the doctor to complete his examination, and then he drove down Front Street toward Mary Milton's restaurant. One thing, hold your Hobo ran along beside the team. There was a light in the restaurant, the only one in the block. It was still the middle of the night as far as Dawson was concerned. Oh, okay. oh. As the sergeant opened the door, he saw Mary sitting at one of the rear tables. She was crying. A middle-aged man was standing beside her, and the sergeant recognized him as Charles Martin, the manager of the trading company. Sergeant Preston. Yes, Charlie, good morning. Well, it isn't a good morning for me. I was just about to go over to headquarters and report a robbery. Your store? Yes. My assistant has left town. 
He's been living in back of the store. Well, when I unlocked the place this morning, I found the safe wide open and all of the gold gone. Well, that doesn't mean Phil took it. Well, he's gone, Mary, and without saying a oh, word. he told me he was going. But you've admitted that he wouldn't tell you where or why. I won't believe he stole your gold. Charlie, does this cap belong to Phil? Huh? Why, he wore one like it. Let me see. Not just Jed. What's his last name? Camel. Phil Camel. Sergeant, do you know where he is? Yes, I do. Oh, where is he all right? Mary, this is a strange case, and I have very little to work on. You said that Phil told you he was leaving town. When was that? Last night. It was about 10 o'clock. I was just getting ready to close up when he came in. I knew there was something wrong the moment I saw his face. Mary. Oh, hello, Phil. I'll be ready to go as soon as I put these dishes away. Mary, I... I can't take you home. I have some work to finish up tonight. Tonight? Oh, but why? It isn't the first of the month or anything. I have to get my books up to date. I... I'm going away. What for? To buy furs? No, no. I, I'm all through with the company. Mary. This is goodbye for us. It's... What? Something's happened. I I thought maybe it was possible to forget and start all over up here. But that isn't true. I haven't told you anything about my past. You never asked any questions. Oh, why should I? I wasn't interested in your past. But you guessed there was something wrong just because I didn't say anything. No, I didn't. And I still don't believe there... Or even if you have done something wrong, it doesn't matter now... You and I are all that matter. Our future. There isn't going to be any future for you and me. I mean it, Mary. This is goodbye. I'm leaving tonight. Oh, you can't. There's no sense in talking about it. Goodbye. <laughs> that, that was all he said. He left me standing right here. I see. Now, uh, what about the robbery, Charlie? Well, the safe was opened when I got to the store this morning. The gold was gone, and so were most of Phil's belongings. That's all. Where is he, Sergeant? In the hospital. Oh. I found him in a deserted cabin last night, about 15 miles north of here. You mean he's hurt? He was unconscious then. He still is. He's been badly beaten up. A concussion. Oh. I don't know whether he stole your gold or not, Charlie, but he didn't have it with him. There had been other men at that cabin. Perhaps they have it now. I know the direction they took, but I had to bring Phil back here. I'm going to report to headquarters, and then I'll hit the trail again. Sergeant, Phil isn't going to die. You'd better have a talk with the doctor, Mary. I'll see you both later. The first person the sergeant met when he opened the door at headquarters was young Constable Downey. Hello, Sergeant. Welcome back. Hey, isn't that hobo out there with King and the team? Yes. Where's the inspector? Yeah, he's going down to Whitehorse. Uh, I've been in charge for the last few days, but now that you're, you're here... You're still in charge. I'm working on a case. Oh, what? Robbery, perhaps murder. Hey. I need a few supplies. Help me with them, and I'll tell you all about it. Sure thing. As the two men loaded the sergeant's sled with fresh supplies, the sergeant gave Downey a full report on the case. But there was one detail that stuck in the constable's mind. It was Hobo's present that led you to camp. Yes? I may have a lead for you, Sergeant. Huh? What? I saw Hobo in town last night. He was pulling a sled, working as a lead. Jim, the man, uh, the men who were driving the sled, what about them? Men, two of them. Hmm. Can't give you much of a description. They were down the street a ways. Anything will help. Mm, caribou parkas. Hoods were pulled up over their heads. Was Camel one of them? No. No, I'm sure of that. These were bigger men. But in town last night... Isn't there any chance of Camel talking? No, not for a while. No sense in waiting. I know the men who were with him headed north from the cabin last night, and there's only one town between here and the border. Mm, Forty miles. Right. Crowded with miners, too. It'd be like looking for a needle in a haystack. You have nothing to go on. Hobo knows them. He knows their team, and when Hobo meets anyone he knows, he tells the world about it. I'll admit his testimony wouldn't amount to much in court, but if he says hello to two men with caribou parkas, and I find gold on their sled... Well, that's the only chance I have. Goodbye, Jim. Good luck, Sergeant. All right, King, up front, boy. Come on, hobo, we need your help. I'm King! On your husky! Late that afternoon, in the hotel at 40 Mile, Hex Norwell burst into the room he was sharing with Red Crocker. What's 
the matter with you? Monty just came into town. What about it? I knew he shouldn't have stopped here. You found another lead dog for I us? I found the one that ran away. What? Yeah, he's with the Monty. What if the red coat found Campbell? Now, take it easy. What if Campbell talked? Dead men don't. Yeah, but he wasn't dead when we left. He couldn't have lived for an hour in that coat. He might have. How come that big dog's with the red coat? Just attached himself the same way he did to us. Where is this Monty? He was driving his team around and back. I'll take a look at him. There's a window at the end of the hall up here. There were a number of teams tied up in back of the hotel. And as the sergeant was unharnessing his, Hobo broke away from his side. Oh? Well, King, it looks as if Hobo's found some friends already. Let's take a look at them, boy, and at the sled they've been pulling. As the sergeant walked over to Hobo, the big dog proved that it wasn't impossible for him to learn a lesson. The episode of the Martins baby had impressed on him that it was wrong to take things that belonged to other people, even to make the sergeant a present. The stained hunting cap was sticking out of the sergeant's parka. Hobo whimpered apologetically, gently pulled the cap from the sergeant's parka and carried it over to the sled and dropped it there. Then he looked up into the sergeant's face and asked for his approval. That where it belongs, Hobo? On this sled? Good boy. Now all I have to do is find out who owns this sled and team. And just in case they show up while I'm inside the hotel, you stand guard here, King. Understand, boy? Guard this sled. The sergeant started for the hotel. The two men watched him from the window on the second floor. I guess that proves it, doesn't it? That was Campbell's cap. I recognized it. The Mountie found him. He's talked to him. He's coming in here and arrest us. Shut up. we got to get out of here. How far would we get? No. We've got to take care of that Monty before we leave. How? In the same way we took care of Campbell. They'll ask about us at the desk. They'll be coming up to our room. Well, we'll be waiting for them. Come on. The sergeant climbed the stairs to the second floor slowly. The gathering dusk made the long hall very dark. He had to look closely to make out the room numbers. 217 was near the back of the building. He knocked. The sergeant opened the door. There was a man inside sitting at a table writing by the light of an oil lamp. Are you Crocker? I uh, know. What do you want with him, sergeant? You must be Norwell. That's right. Won't you come in and sit down? Yes. As the sergeant stepped into the room, Red jumped on him from behind the door. He cut off his wind with a vice-like forearm around his neck and raised his gun to bring it down on the sergeant's head. I got him. But you two have it. No. Before the blow could be struck, Red went sailing over the sergeant's head and crashed into the table, knocking it over. The sergeant jumped on top of him, twisting the gun from his grasp. There's nothing like guilt to make a man give himself away. You're under arrest. Hex! The second man stepped up behind the sergeant and brought his gun down on his head. Oh! Hey, got him good. Not good enough for me. Hey, Dawn, he's out cold. We can leave him here. Hey, fire! What? The lamp, it's smashed. The oil's burning. Stamp it out. No. I'll get the gold, quick. Let the place burn. We'll lock him in here. Hurry up. There is no explanation for the sixth sense that always warned King the sergeant was in danger. The dog had been ordered to guard the stranger's sled, but his intelligence was such that he knew when to disobey an order, and yet he had no intention of leaving the sled unguarded. Hobo was commanded to take his place. And Hobo seemed to understand the command. At any rate, he took King's place as King ran toward the rear entrance of the hotel. The rear door was closed. King ran around to the front. Two men were entering the hotel, and King slipped in with them. He streaked across the lobby and up the stairs. Then down the long hall to the room where the sergeant was lying unconscious. He leaped against the door. The room clerk had seen King enter. There was a rule against dogs in the hotel, and now the clerk came panting down the hall after him. He saw the smoke seeping under the bottom of the door. Come on in, thunder. Uh, fire! Help, fire! Where's my key? The flames from the oil had crept as far as the table, and one leg was burning. The clerk hurried to put it out, but King went straight to his master and licked his face. Oh. I'll give you a hand in a second, Sergeant. Oh, King, old boy. Uh, here now, maybe you better just lay where you are. No, help me up. Okay. Where were the two men who were in here? Search me. They didn't come down the front stairs. And they must have used the back. I still have my gun. Yes. Let's go, King. <laughs> Out in back of the hotel, Hobo stood at bay in front of the sled. Get out of the way, you mutt. I grab hold of him. Pull him aside, Red. I'll teach him. I got the team harnessed. Hurry. He needs a safe treatment. We gave the sergeant. The blow knocked Hobo aside, but only for a second. 
For the first time in his life, he lost his temper, and he jumped at Red and knocked him down. Shoot him! Shoot the car! Right! Oh, don't drop that gun or I'll do the shooting. Preston! Stop it! Sure. Sure, okay. That's better. Put him up now, hobo. Good dog. You two are under arrest in the name of the Queen. It was a week later that King and the sergeant stopped at the open door of Phil Campbell's room in the hospital. Mary was sitting at Phil's bedside. And the sergeant listened to their talk for a moment before he entered. <laughs> Quiet, boy. Is it all clear now, darling? Well, not entirely. Well, Crocker and Norwell threatened to send me back to jail if I didn't help them rob the company safe. I told them they'd have to wait for my answer, but I had no intention of helping. I decided to go back to the States and serve the rest of my term. I was going to leave Dawson the night I said goodbye to you. Oh, I understand that, but afterwards... What happened afterwards that night? Well, I, I can't tell you much. I, I'd finished with the books, and I was just putting them back in the safe when they came in. They knocked me out. And took you with them when they left town and left you to die in that cabin. Oh, Phil, we're so lucky. For Hobo and Sergeant Preston and King. Lucky, Mary? I'm still going back and take my medicine. A year isn't so long. We'll be waiting for you. We? Hobo and I, didn't I tell you? He seems to have settled down at my place. The whole town is surprised. <laughs> I guess he never realized before what a nice place a restaurant could be. Any place is nice if, if you're there, Mary. Don't ever forget that, darling. <laughs> hmm. It looks to me, King, as if the case is closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Fellas and girls, picture yourself up there in the Yukon, dog sledding or riding hour after hour like Sergeant Preston. You'd soon find out that real stamina calls for a nourishing He-Man breakfast. So check up on your breakfast tomorrow morning. Be sure it includes a delicious heaping bowlful of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice with milk or cream and fruit. Remember, in these famous cereals shot from guns, you get extra food values of restored natural grade amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Ask for Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice in the big red and blue Quaker packages. Never sold in bags or bulk. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case... The doctor disappears. When Phil Carver's little boy became seriously ill and Dr. McComb couldn't be located, King and I took on the job of tracking down the doctor. We didn't know that he was being held prisoner by a pair of dangerous outlaws, and that all of us, including Phil's family, would soon find ourselves at the outlaw's mercy. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. These radio dramas, a feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereals shot from guns. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker...